So, the audience, the students, I wrote already to your guest book that this is a great, I do this with a great respect and with a great joy. Because, of course, it's very important to speak with students. You will have the responsibility for the future. And uh, so I hope that uh, my generation also remembers our responsibilities. So uh, I have promised, we have agreed that I will speak about the sustainable development, but uh, the floor is open also for different kind of the questions later on after my speech. I have several hats in UN and in other organizations. So we have, you are free to make questions. I'm free to answer, reply what I want, <laughs> okay. So anyway, the title for my speech is that is sustainable development at risk in today's world. So especially when we have uh, received this week the newest IPCC report. So I think that uh, we still have hope for a more sustainable future, although the optimistic atmosphere of the turn of the millennium has a uh, little bit faded. So, but uh, something what, what is now better is that uh, we know much better the road for a more sustainable future, what we did earlier. And so, uh, of course, there are also reasons to be worried, but I will say that uh, anyway, if you know the target, if you know the roads, so what you need is a political will. Of course, one reason for my concern is that our societies, both here in UK, in USA, and in my own country, they are more divided than before. The dissatisfaction that has been growing under the surface has now come to light. Democratic elections have brought results that were not necessarily anticipated. Some people and also some very popular politicians wish to turn inwards and be more protective of their self-interest. However, our most pressing problems, including climate change, cannot be solved by individual people or countries. We need strong cooperation. So, the audience, we have come a long way. At the end of the 1960s, scientists, economists, and in the industrialists gathered in Rome to discuss global problems. That uh, was how the Club of Rome was born. In uh, the 1980s, the Brundtland Commission, chaired by the former Prime Minister of Norway, Gruhar Brundtland, defined the term sustainable de development in their report. In 2000, world leaders came together to adopt the United Nations Millennium Declaration to reduce extreme poverty. The Millennium Development Goals led to successful initiative against poverty and hunger and for better health and education. Um, I was in that time already active in, in UN politics and I remember how many of my good colleagues said to me that good ideas but you really have blue eyes. But then afterwards they said that uh, it was realistic and we made it. So. This decade, 2010, is uh, full of uncertainties. It is, however, the world we live in and we cannot wait that it will come better before we make an SDGs. We have to do it this kind of the world we are living now. So, <laughs> slide. So you remember this, I think that you have been in, in many lectures. So um, the adoption of the Agenda 2030, Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals, it was made in September 2015 and it was a remarkable moment. I was present and I think that I really felt that this is now something we are doing for ourselves and for the future. So all nations came together at the United Nations to agree on a new holistic framework which aims for a more prosperous, socially just and ecologically sustainable future for our planet. That brought a lot of hope. 
And it is a framework that now guides the work of the global community, despite the tensions and some forces that draw us apart. So achieving the sustainable development goals requires not only efforts of the governments and international organizations. I welcome very warmly all the progressive presidents and prime ministers to come on board with us. But it is not enough. Uh, parliaments are not enough. We need also private sector, academia, labor movement and civil society. They, they have <coughs> they they have their duties and they have to do their part. But also, we all human beings, individuals, we must also take action in our private lives. The positive thing is that by contributing to sustainability, we also contribute directly our own well-being. We know what to do. And it is a matter of the political will, like I already said. Sustainable development contributes to the fight against climate change, degrading environment, loss of biodiversity, and desertification. But it also tackles the root causes of uncontrolled migration, prolonged conflicts, unemployment, lack of opportunity, and those many inequalities that exist still in our world. So you see it. They are all part of the same entity. So, how to do that? The idea is that we have, of course, uh, we, we have also the duty to see how it goes globally in different parts of the world. But then we need also to see how it is implemented in every single nation, country of the UN. I take an example from the country I know. And this is Finland. And now we take a slide. So um, we have done this already for some years. And uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is implemented at every level, from local to global. Last year, for instance, our government, Finnish government, gave its report to the parliament on the implementation of, uh, of the 2030 Agenda. A strong education system and general stability of social systems can, can be seen, uh, I think, uh, as Finland's strengths. But we have also challenges. Uh, they are, for instance, combating climate change and promoting economic development and employment. We live very much in the north, and uh, of course this is also one, one of the challenges, but also that our industry is uh, very energy intensive, and that's, that's problematic in this situation. But uh, the aim is at a carbon neutral and resource wise society. And uh, when government gives this, uh, this uh, uh, report, so of course it's a question also that uh, then the parliament will have uh, discussions. I'm not fully satisfied with this system yet because that happens normally after the budget discussions and I should I think it should be done before the budget discussions because we have a clear indexes we could use also the indicators to, to show that whether the proposal of the budget by the government is, is also okay concerning uh, SDGs. So uh, I think that we can discuss more about this situation. Our system is, is, is run by the Prime Minister and then there are the different uh, sectors of the society within that. Earlier it was responsible, one was the Minister for Environmental Issues, but then luckily they noticed that the whole government has to have responsibility. And uh, we have a lot of forest in, in Finland. And when mo many of the countries in Europe have already lost their forest, of course, also the EU is interested in our forests. <coughs> But um, we can speak more about that. Then it's one question I have made twice today already, a question about the gender. I have asked that how many women you have among the students and in, in, uh, in the, the different bodies. Because um, um, the audience, so um, 
Of course, there are several partners who work hard the more sustainable future and how it can be found within the UN. And um, they are the specialized agencies, funds and programs support individual countries and regions to do their work. But um, what I have been now interested after my so-called political career has been the gender equality. And we can take a next slide. So this is more to the awake you only telling uh, that uh, the half of the population of our planet are women. Oh, slightly a bit more. We are the a majority. But um, one of the big issues is that uh, sustainable development is not possible without gender <laughs> equality. Uh, it was at the um, Rio Plus 20 summit where we said first time very openly that uh, we have overused our natural resources in many ways but we have also underused the human potential, especially women, but also poor and youth. We can come back on that issue also in, uh, in the discussion. I have worked uh, closely with uh, the World Health Organization and uh, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, and they support the Every Woman, Every Child movement with them, we have promoted the sustainable development goals, ensuring that women and girls enjoy same rights and opportunities as men and boys. The, um, the rights that uh, many of us take, of course, granted, but in many societies, it is still dream for million women and girls. One uh, issue what I asked that how many female students you have here, and I, I heard that this year, the slight majority are women. Uh, do you know what is common with the Helsinki University and with uh, Tehran University with Oxford? <coughs> In all these universities, there is a tendency to have a slight majority of the women. And before the, the leaders of the Iran wanted to make a so-called equal opportunities, they, they, they cut it. Uh, uh, Tehran University, a majority of the women, and so it's 50-50 there, but if it would be free, it would be also with the female majority. So, take it easy, boys, men. You will survive. Smart men will survive, and I think that you are all very convinced that you are. But it seems to be something we can come back to for the discussions. Uh, perhaps I say very, very shortly. I do believe so that uh, girls and women, they understand the importance of education in a different way than what the boys and men do. Because now historically, in many countries, it is the first generation who have this benefit. And that's why they do work very hard in order to use it. But let's see how it is in the, in the future. So <laughs> come back to the sustainable development. So. Um, uh, you know that uh, both the millennium goals in 2000 and also now the sustainable development goals, they are not judicially uh, uh, effective uh, agreements, but they are just political agreements. But even I, as a former lawyer, I, I thought that uh, it is a really weak agreement if it's not also the judicially uh, binding, binding, but um, that was not true. Political and politics is the most important part. Uh, but there are also this kind of internationally, judicially uh, binding agreement among the SDG process. And this is climate, climate agreement uh, concerning the Paris Agreement. This is really a judicial agreement. And that's why it's also very important that we should respect it. So the audience, there is a two-way relationship between sustainable development and climate change. And uh, it is important that strategies take into account both. So we can take the uh, next, next slide. Um, the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, published its latest report on Monday. And the situation is, of course, very worrying. It, it gave a lot of twitterings, which told that, that now we have really to hurry up, and that's true. If the, global if the global warming 
has to be limited to 1.5 degrees of Celsius. It would need rapid and far-reaching transitions in different sectors of the society. But I think that you have already studied the statements on that. One co-chair, co co Jim Sik, uh, from the working group number three, described that limiting the warming would require unprecedented changes in our patterns. The risk is that we might be moving forward too slowly. I think that it's not might be. I think that we are moving forward too slowly. Uh, on the other hand, we have seen strong responses. For example, American states, cities and companies have highlighted their support to Paris Climate Agreement. And this is something when their own president has said something very different. And uh, these uh, American communities, they have continued their actions also after President Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement. On other way around, let's be very open and honest on, in this, of course, President Trump has much more possibilities already before that, because just uh, cutting the budget for the, for the United Nations or for, for many other such kind of the international organizations, very easily they can also to slow down the speed. But uh, then what about our common European Union when you still are members? So um, <laughs> what about the EU? <laughs> EU faces energy and climate change challenges and um, the targets are there by 2020. First, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 20%. Um, to increase the share of the renewable energy to at least 20% of the consumption and achieving energy savings of 20% or more. Also, there must be a 10% share of renewable energy in transport sector of all countries. Uh, you might be also read the newspapers or heard in TV that uh, how hard it was to, to achieve and certain kind of the compromise just uh, recently. In Europe, I think we can succeed if we are ready to use resources wisely and work together. But I say openly that it would be very interesting to hear from you how you see the role of the Brexit influencing European solutions and, and what will be the role of the UK in this same, same situation. So a um, little bit being a cynical, I could say that when I have followed the UK situation, I have said that, and I have been in politics 40 <laughs> years, um, that uh, sometimes there is a risk that, if, that you will get what you have voted for. And that's good to remember, that it's not any kind of research that how do you think. When you vote, you take a responsibility and results for next year's. It's not something you can go to the shop next week and say that, sorry, made a mistake. And that's why I always underline that elections are real still, even they sound sometimes very old fashioned. It is the real way to, to have an influence to the democratic society. But we can come back to this later on in the discussion part. So the audience, I take another example from the North. And uh, if you take a next slide. So it's not only the countries, UN, or I not even EU, but we have all also different kind of the, um, the broad variety of the international organizations doing the work. One of them is um, the Arctic Council, which is a forum for the Arctic states and Arctic indigenous communities. Finland is holding the chairmanship of the council until next year, and that's why it's good to take this as an example for my lecture. The Arctic Council is an important arena for discussing a pathway towards more sustainable future amongst the region's countries, including Russia and United States. When Finland began its role as a chair, the ministers, including Tillerson and Lavrov, signed onto the so-called Fairbanks Declaration. The declaration highlights the need for conservation and sustainable use of the Arctic marine environment and addresses the impacts of the climate change. Since then, President Trump's administration has seen many changes. 
The global political situation has not made Arctic cooperation very easy, but it is an example on how dialogue can be maintained in the matters relating to sustainable development. In a way, it has been the area where we have succeeded still work together, including also these big countries I mentioned. One issue that has been brought up is how to reduce black carbon emissions. This is to slow down the warming in Arctic region. It is an example on how to find ways to cooperate and combat the climate change despite sometimes very challenging political negotiation situations. And then if we take a last, oh, the dirt is not there. Okay, and, and then the last slide, please. So you are responsible very much for the future because um, you are making a very important part of the academia. So um, last but not least, let me come back to the role of academia and universities in sustainable development. The role of research and monitoring is very important because nowadays people want to see not only the way, the road, and the results, but also to have an evidence is how it has happened or how it has not happened. And uh, that's, why, that's why you are part of this expertise, how we can do that. I have been part of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network, so-called so Leaders' Council from its start from uh, 2012. And this SDSN network promotes practical solutions for sustainable development. And the focus is scientific and technological expertise. Um, I have worked together with friends from the British universities and others. And I hope that this network can grow and people get interested at national and regional levels. Uh, I know that among you is so there are also some, some uh, students from Finland. Um, I myself, I'm a chair of the board of Helsinki University, and we have been active also to, to play a role in, in this kind of the cooperation. So you are also one of those who can be already now learning to know the Sustainable Solution Network. You can also be active in different ways to combine the cooperation more effectively <coughs> between the universities. Of course, I know that you have a quite a responsibility because of the history of your, your universities, but I'm also very convinced that you can be worth of that, that history. So, dear friends, dear audience, I started by saying that the society seemed to be more divided than before. Globalization has brought a lot of good during the last decades, but it has also brought problems and affected people negatively uh, in unfair way. So, however, I think globalization is here to stay and expand. The question asked are usually, I would say that they are not normally wrong, but unfortunately the responses, the answers can be quite often. So I think that there is a plenty of knowledge and resources to do better. And the problems are complex and challenging, and so are the solutions. But they are not impossible. And this is my, my, my message for you. It's not impossible. In spite of the all challenges, I really think so that, that uh, when we work together, when we are convinced, when we are committed, so we can do the sustainable future. And if our generation does not do it, perhaps the next ones has not even the possibilities. Thank you. So I want to begin by asking about the, uh, the role of multilateral institutions in combating climate change and in promoting sustainability. Um, how do you think that multilateralism and international agreements uh, can survive given the challenge of isolationism with Trump's America, withdrawing from the Paris Agreement? What do we need to do to ensure that these agreements have real impact and have real meaning? So multilateral system is, is uh, very easy to understand in such a way that I think that the um, students and, and professors, teachers uh, present, present the, you, you know very well that you can work very hard by your own studies, but uh, 
very easily you will find that you need a team to work together. You know also that even you have an excellent professor somewhere, <laughs> but uh, it's not enough, you need more, and you need a cooperation between them. And multilateralism is, is also the place where even the smaller nations can have a role. I heard that some of you are already now from China here. China will have an enormous responsibility in future for sustainable development. I know the country not enough, but somewhat, and I know that they have also done a lot of work in, in, in different parts of the country. But I think that all this expertise, what, uh, for instance, the Europeans or Americans have today, um, could be useful. And in that way, this kind of the cooperation is needed. But the multilateralism is also good in such a way that nobody's voice will have a too big echo. That we can make an, what I could say, the symphony together, so that it really works. And that's why whatever we are doing with an one single nation or with a smaller, smaller combinations is not enough if we really want also to get, for instance, Africa on board or the different other fragile countries. Uh, but when we do it, we also get much more resources to ourselves. Um, I could take an example for a small country called Cuba. Uh, Cuba was um, blockaded in economics, I think 40 years or something like that, and they have survived. Of course, it has not been easy, and I, I never hoped for anyone to be in, in such kind of a situation in the country. But they have also noticed that in some areas they have made such kind of the solutions what we others can also use in SDGs. Uh, the same concerning the poor countries more generally in the planet. That uh, I always repeat that the poor people of this planet, they are just poor, they are not stupid. Somebody, sometimes the situation that they are poor push them to make a stupid decisions, but as such they are not uh, stupid. And that's why I think say that the multilateralism also is like a, it's like a treasure finding that we can with that find what the different nations have to give for our common good. And do you think that multilateral uh, effectiveness uh, and success is under threat from the populist movements we see? Yeah, countries such as yeah, Hungary, yeah, America. Yeah, yeah. Hungary. I think that uh, it's a funny thing if you if you know that there is outside outside uh, of your home there is a um, risk. Of course, for the while you can think that closing your doors and windows, you are more insane. But in the matter of fact, the the longer you are inside, you will understand that sooner or later you have to come out. I always say that I don't know any fortress in the history of any country. Which, which could protect the people forever. Uh, whatever has been, ah, Chinese have also experience in, in that, concerning the Great Wars and so. But, uh, but also in, 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 uh, in Europe we have had also, all the fortresses will come down, but the only way is the cooperation, integration, very hard uh, learning how to work together. So I, I do think so that we all should have our special responsibility for the international cooperation. That's concerning also my own country, which has also cut its development cooperation uh, finance quite strongly a few years ago. We hope so that in next parliamentary elections we will take another other, other, other way of tackling these issues. Compared to Britain, uh, Nordic countries seem to have a much greater respect for environmentalism, ecological conservation, sustainability. Uh, do you think that's a cultural and social issue? Or is there something that we can do politically to help those values be transferred from the Nordic setting they currently thrive in to the British setting, to the American setting? What lessons can we apply from the success of these values? At least we can, we can learn from the Nordic system that the welfare society doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, stop you being uh, very competitive. That uh, it's the it's other way around, that uh, being socially and other ways uh, more fair, you, also, you, are, you will be also more competitive. 
Uh, I don't know, sometimes they are thinking that why it is so in the north, so whether it's uh, because of the hard nature that everybody has to try his or her best and, and then after all these efforts to remember that that uh, sometimes you need also a good luck or the help of your neighbour. And then you, you get this kind of feeling that the common solidarity. <laughs> but the fact is that uh, some issues are much easier for us than for, for instance, for Americans, what I have learned when I was a short time lecturing at Harvard University. Um, so I mean that when we think that uh, our education system, which is, um, which is um, uh, concerning all boys and girls, which is without any, any, any student fees, which is uh, in that way uh, comprehensive, the same concerning the health, <coughs> Uh, and uh, many other issues, so that um, we think that it it's also makes a good sense in economics that we have a collective responsibility. Of course, we have the ways how we try to see that nobody misuse it, but, uh, but uh, we have used to work together, and not only together with one in the one generation, but also, for instance, my own country, which was the poorest of the five Nordic sisters, <coughs> I say always sisters, not brothers, so, because it's a caring society. So, uh, our parents and grandparents made it for the next generations. It was not for them impossible to think that even I haven't got this, this benefit, that we can do it for the next generation. And this is exactly now what we have to do for the, for the sustainable development. That we cannot think that we will get them clean that the, all the seas will be green and everything will be fine during our time, but we can think that perhaps our children, or in my case, grandchildren, we have this benefit. And, and so um, this, is, this is natural, the cooperation in the generation, between the generations. Um, and in that way, I think it's easier with us, but it's not impossible for, for the others. Um, Why I compared it with Americans, I had a good example where very how could I say, uh, not very scientific. Um, my, my security, I have, according to the legislation, I have on security. Then I had one policeman from, with me at the Harvard, and then he explained when he discussed with his American colleague that, yes, he, uh, this Finnish policeman, that I have three children, and they all have now gone to the university and so on, and, and everything's all right. And then this guy asked that, how is it possible? And then he explained exactly this Nordic system. And then, oh, that sounds to be a very good system. But who pays it? And then he answered that with the taxation. And then the American response was, I'm, I'm not ready to pay for anybody's self education. Even we, they have explained it, that how it works with all of us. And I think that if you very strongly always encourage people to say that you have to do it, you have to do it, you have all the possibilities, then you forget the other side of the coin. I don't say that all Americans think in the same way, but I say that the slogan has become a burden for their thinking, that you have to do it. You can say, we can do it, and then it's much easier. I want to ask about this question about division between different parts of the country and different generations. Um, in 2010, when a Pride march in Helsinki was attacked, mm -hmm. um, a Christian Democrat spokesperson said this was a, a counter reaction to the elite's shift to liberal values. Um, as a Leading in the bubble. <laughs> okay, yeah, go on. As a leader who supported such progressive <laughs> social changes, uh, how do you think it's best to counter these accusations of elitism and the bubble? And how do you think we can spread social values so that the whole country is in unison behind um, progressive values in this case, is where they are uh, bringing equality to more people? Yeah, and to me, it's cynical, you could say that uh, at least I would love to, to choose my own pubu, but, but anyway, so in other way around is, of course, that uh, uh, such kind that we and the people and so on, it always tells something about uh, the speaker's own point of view, which in a way you could, uh, you could say that this is a pubu. But the question is that what, is the, what are the links between these different kind of the groups? Uh, for instance, in Finland, it was very interesting to see that, uh, as you have already noticed, I'm an I'm a elderly lady. I have five grandchildren, four, four, four children, not all made by myself, but, but uh, we have inherited it in the modern family. So, um, 
uh, when I was young and a student leader, student radically in the nine uh, in the late 1960s, 1970s, so the abortion was still Ill illegal in, in Finland. Homosexualism was, uh, was a crime and so on. And uh, so I have seen during the years that how step by step it has succeeded to get a communication uh, between the different kind of the groups. And um, the sexual minority is a very good example. So little by little we, we get, an, we have not too liberal, but quite liberal abortion legislation. We have, uh, we had already taken away the homosexuals from the criminal court, then we took it away from the, from the <laughs> doctor's handbook. And, and after that, we said that it's all right, everybody can decide by themselves. But still it was in that time the, for the coalition government from the different political parties, just plus this Christian Union, um, it was impossible to propose an equal marriage, which means that also the man could marry the other man or woman or other woman. <laughs> and, and then uh, the, the government denied to give such kind of proposal. We have a so-called citizen's proposal, which means that every single citizen can start collecting names. And if they get them 50,000, so the parliament has to uh, discuss or to handle it. And uh, so it happened that people, they, they collected this uh, more than it was, I think. If I could remember correctly, it was 100,000, something like that. But anyway, clearly much more than this 50,000. And then the parliament decided to do so. They said, it's all right. If they want to marry, so we get more happy people, it's not dangerous. And uh, so it happened, not with the government, but with the in the parliament by the opposition and those groups which were represented in the government. So sometimes such <coughs> kind of the new type of the uh, systems in democratic system can work. They tried also to take it back with the same system, but the parliament didn't pass. They, they kept what they have said. And as I said, we are still going strong, no difficulties. <laughs> Uh, the final question for me, I want to ask about the issue of Brexit that you yes. raised in your speech. Um, it's obviously very difficult to balance multilateral uh, cooperation and collaboration with the need to protect national sovereignty and to respect the different uh, cultures of European member states. Um, do you think that the discussion of ever closer union uh, that Juncker is promoting mm -hmm. is something that threatens the national sovereignties of different members or is it the correct way for Europe to continue uh, on this trajectory? Um, I myself, I'm not very strong uh, supporter of the f fed uh, federation. I, I'm, I'm a supporter of the strong union uh, because I think that uh, so far the feeling of the people that how they, they get their voice to be heard, it's sometimes difficult even at the national level but it seemed to be so that the European Parliament has not yet reached the same level. Uh, how to do then it so? I, I, I'm not quite clear about that. I have been always more in the UN and in many other international organizations than, than in EU. Of course, as being a prime minister, as being a foreign minister and then the president, the foreign minister five years and president 12 years, I attended to the different meetings. But I always had a feeling that it was more far away than uh, what we could hope because uh, um, it was somewhere there in Strasbourg or in, in Brussels. And I think that just adding, the, giving them more power doesn't make them closer. We should find the ways how uh, the citizens of the different countries could feel that it's also their Europe, their system. So I understand. I s understand the critics concerning the European Union and the Parliament of uh, European Union, but, but I don't accept uh, the way to react, to leave it, <laughs> like some have done or are trying to do. I mean that uh, it's anyway so, so possibly effective way to work together for Europeans that we should more s concentrate doing it better. And, and to trying to listen that why the people think in such a way. I think part of these this, uh, critics is concerning globalization, not the EU as such. But um, 
but I think that some some issues, even if we, if we are not doing the federation, can be can be done or should be done better. One is, of course, we are we are the members of the, monet, the monetary union EMU, um, and so I think that uh, being frank and honest in in uh, also with finance, uh, it it should make it better. Yeah, but uh, this is. Uh, this is very interesting. How it is possible that in USA, um, Americans can agree concerning the, the uh, dollar, the common currency. They can agree in foreign politics, but they can have a different kind of the criminal, criminal code or even the, the, the marriage laws in different states. When in the EU we have exactly the vice versa, yeah. that we cannot agree in foreign policy, we have difficulties in EMU, but if you have a death penalty in acting, you cannot become a member of the European Union. So, so somehow we are different, even we have the same, same family background. True. Great, I'd like to move okay. to questions from the audience now. So if you can wait till a microphone reaches you, just so it's recorded, but then please do speak up because the microphone yeah, won't amplify. And, and it speak say. up so loudly that old ladies can listen to you. Right. Let's, you. Let's start with the hand in the back there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you, considering your um, advocacy for um, women's rights and LGBTQ community, I want to know, how do you think change begins? Um, because coming from a country like India, where marital rape is still legal, um, and there has been um, a lot of um, ab advocates who have been trying to make it illegal, who are trying to criminalize marital rape from MPs to NGOs, but it's not picking up any momentum, right? Um, so I want to ask you from someone who has such great experience um, in women equality, how do you think a change like this begins? I have had a very good, uh, good uh, in, uh, members from India in, uh, in the UN, UN uh, Commit, uh, committee concerning the sexual and reproductive health and rights. They were very, very good ladies. I think that in India you have a lot of, lot of really fantastic women and men who could perhaps answer it better. But in, in our case, I would say so that listen people that why they think that uh, family affairs should be something that you cannot speak loudly. Concerning especially the sexual and reproductive health and rights, I have very often faced the fact that uh, the readers say that, you know, in our culture, these are so private, so intimate issues that we cannot speak about them in, in public. But exactly the, in the same countries, they can uh, punish, for instance, the homosexualism very openly, they can, they can do a negative things very, very easily. So I say that why cannot you then protect somebody from the violence? And concerning the rape, I think that it's, it's, um, it has been perhaps not a good idea that we speak it as a sexual act, because it's not a sexual act, it's concerning the violence. And we see it very easily also now in, in these uh, armed conflicts, when both the women and girls, but also more and more so men and boys are raped. So, so it's not concerning sex, it's just one way of the violence. And if we speak about family, so family should be something where you are caring each other, uh, you are, you are uh, supporting them, you are doing the life easier. And if you try to use violence on that, it's against all the principles of the family. And in that way, I would say that, uh, that uh, why you can think that in the family, the issues which you don't accept by the outsider are allowed. But um, I will encourage you to speak with, uh, with the other people in your own country. You are very clever in that. And you can find the ways also how you can how you can help the victims to make them stronger and not feeling to be ashamed and to give a 
even the smaller possibility for the different kind of the life. Because very often if you ask, also in Europe, in Finland even, <laughs> you ask that why you have, stand, uh, why you have been so long time with a uh, violent husband? They said, you know, we had, we had four children, I hadn't worked, somehow you have to eat. And then of course you can also help by the society, giving the shelters, giving the possibilities, educating, adult education, give the possibilities for earnings and so be very pragmatic. And then these kind of the people who have experienced these kind of the terrible things by themselves, when they come out and they tell, like now in, uh, in the latest Nobel Peace Prize. So I mean that then, uh, then you, of course, better believe a person you know and, and you know the background than me who come from this outside. But I think that this could be perhaps the advice. For instance, the family violence has been a long time in Finland, a very bad, bad problem. And we have tried with these shelters, we have tried giving the more economical responsibility for women and, and taking it also to, to the, finally also to the <coughs> penal code that it is a crime. And to say that even if the wife says, or the wife says that I don't want that this is the case to the law court. They said that violence in such kind of the violence is a crime and it will go to the court. Great, moving to the next Thank question you. here. Let's go to the uh, gentleman in the second row here in the suit. Hi, uh, thank you for sharing your time with us this evening. Uh, you have really light behind you, that's why I'm <laughs> trying to see you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to hear your speech, and uh, I do feel it's really an issue to the interest of the globe. So um, my question is on your point that you mentioned uh, in the U.S., despite the state action to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, uh, some industry and businesses are actually showing support for the, uh, for the uh, agreement and for those legislators who uh, filed the agreements. So my question is, do you think that for our generation and for the generations to come, is it more effective and a realistic approach to, to try a bottom-up approach to motivate everybody and every business to, act, to activate, to motivate our legislators instead of relying on our uh, legislators to act on our behalf? I think that it's both and. It's, uh, it's, it's easy to say that you need both and. It would be much, much faster. Uh, even if we think that instead of the President Trump, we, we have a President H, for instance, and if he or she would say that, let's do it, let's, we, we want to hurry up, but we will help your country and your country to do this, it would be much, much better. But I mean only that uh, even the even the president who doesn't accept the whole Paris Agreement, they cannot stop it. They can make it slower. And I think this can be dangerous because the nature cannot wait for. But um, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that at least in the countries what I call democratic, where you can, you can vote. So very often I say that you get as good government and parliament as you deserve because you have voted it. And, and that's why I come again to that, that be active politically. And, and uh, so, um, so I think that this is one. But if you start with the people thinking that what they buy, how they consume, what they eat, and how they behave with, um, with uh, energy issues, and so if they do it by themselves, so they also demand very often that those they will vote will do the same. Because uh, why they should give the possibility for the MP or the minister to be different, the less active. And that's why I say that uh, it's both and. It's not, no, it's not both and. And, and uh, now lately, yesterday morning, it was in the Finnish broadcasting company, they asked about the MPs who, who are now trying to become re-elected, that what you have done yourself. What have you done yourself? Sometimes it's, it's very difficult if you are living in the city and so on, and what to do. But um, for instance, they say that what you eat, have you, have you eaten less red meat? Have you changed to the vet, um, vegetables or the fish? Have, have you used the fishes which are not under the 
which are not in the, in the risk. For instance, the WWF is, has done, in, at least in Finland, they have a handbook where you can see that which kind of the fish is now easy to eat. Or you can say that uh, uh, biking is better than, than uh, driving a car, but if you need a car, it's better to try to find that how you can either to have it together or you can have it in, in a hybrid model or so on. I mean, there are different ways. Or I normally say for the younger ones, if I speak with them, <coughs> the school boys and girls, and I said, it's also the same that how much you want to be fashionable. How m that if you understand the vegetables, if you understand different kinds, and you are, you are giving the good critics for your parents, how is it, how is it about <coughs> your new genes? Do you really need them? Well, is it only that it would be nice to get them? <coughs> okay. Great. Moving on to, yeah. Let's go to the gentleman on the far side here. Uh, do you think enough is being done to get the private sector on board with sustainable development? I think that the private sector is very important. I think that we said already years ago that early bird will find the, uh, the, the mask and so on. I, I mean that um, quite many corporations have noticed that. And if we take an, another example, you remember the scandal in, in, uh, in um, car factories that when they said that they will make them more environmental friendly cars and then it showed that uh, they were doping. It was not true. And, and so I said that the good side in the whole issue was, of course, that they understood that the consumers would like, love to get such kind of the cars. The bad side <coughs> was that they, they had a doping, that it was a fake. And, and that's why what the, I said to you that uh, you will have in the future, many of you, such kind of the career where you can give society be more honest and transparent. That really it means. Or if you are working, any of you are working with statistics? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, they must be, but they're shy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I mean that the statistics is, uh, when I was first, uh, first time invited by the, by the international meeting of the people who were experts in statistics, I thought, what, what, what they really, why, why they ask me to come there? But then I noticed that, as I said, as a former lawyer, that, ah, they are important. They make the evidences. And if they do really an honest and could plant statistics so we can tell it for the people and people will demand it and then we will get the better MPs and ministers and presidents and, and prime ministers. Don't hesitate to go to the <coughs> politics. They might need you. Okay. Great. We'll take one final question from the audience. Uh, let's go to the hand about halfway down there. Yeah, this one over here. I'd like to have a, ask a question about global inequality. Something you mentioned, <coughs> sorry, something you mentioned earlier today is the importance of multilateralism and cooperation in tackling the issue of climate change. Now, I was wondering, um, how do we negotiate historical inequalities and injustices between the global north and south? So the claims of countries who are trying to industrialize or are industrializing and then you have countries in the global north who have previously done so and profited very much, telling them, no, you can't do this because it's not good for the climate. Yeah. So how do you negotiate situations like that? So I think that it's not a secret if we say that um, the industrialized countries should, uh, should uh, pay more responsibility. They should pay more because of what they have done. But another way around to say, that whatever the Finland, Sweden, Norway and Denmark are doing, it doesn't save the planet. They can be a good example, but what the India, China uh, or, or Nigeria is doing, that's, that's a crucial point. Uh, but, um, but I think that, of course, the history is important. That's why I think that when we made the Millennium Goals, 2000, which was a diplomatic surprise and not at all open and democratic decision process. So in that time, so-called South was very happy. They said, finally, we get the first global 
social justice agreement. And when we then started to, to plan the new sustainable development goals, they were all, all almost all against. They said, OK, you try only to take away uh, what you, you, you owed that you, you should pay for us. And um, that's why I say that the old demand of the ODA, for instance, ODA concerning all the cooperation help, for instance, uh, the know-how in techniques and, and uh, in many other areas is important. But it's also important to notice that today uh, the baby, baby in the north uh, will be four times more expensive for the planet than the baby in the south. That's, that's not the reason why the South should have four times more babies, not of course. But it should be, of course, the, all the time to be sharing the responsibilities. But I say very, very quite strongly that I think that concerning the climate change demands as such, we cannot say that because we made it in the past, you should get now the possibility to make the same mistake because nature doesn't know such kind of the balancing. Because our planet is in the risk if the China will make the same mistakes what, what the Europe has done or if the India is doing that. But when we have to find other ways to balance it because the planet is one. <coughs> but um, as I said already, there are the other ways to, to help the, the big, uh, <coughs> less rich countries. Um, anybody from Sweden? One. Sorry. Sorry now to say. Finland was the 600 years, more than 600 years part of Sweden. Then the king of Sweden lost the war against the Russia. And then they gave the eastern part of the country to Russians. That was Finland. And then we were 100 years under the Russian Tsar. And then when the Lenin declared the Red Revolution, we thought that that's the good time now to, to say goodbye, and we did it. But then afterwards, uh, immediately after that, we get the one civil war, and then thanks for the, the Stalin, we got the two other wars. And then as a last one, we became uh, one of the Nordic welfare states. So that's why I always say sorry for the Swedes, because we had, we had no time to, to colonize anybody, because we were colonized ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have to choose somebody else to be your king or queen than your own ones, the Swedes were not the worst. <laughs> but um, then I mean that uh, even saying this, and a little bit with a sense of humor, of course my country has benefited a lot being one of the European countries. So in that way, I say that we have to pay also for the southern brothers and sisters to help them. But in a way that they don't, they, that they don't uh, be damaging our, our planet. So let's do it together so that uh, it will happen, the sustainable development. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause. <laughs>